I would like to welcome you all very much to our first lockdown lunchtime. I'm really excited about this series of talks and I hope you enjoy them as much as I think I'm going to enjoy them. And we'll be doing a different topic every week. The City of Butchery Green, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the site. It's had many names, um, Butchery Green, Birchley Green, Butcher Lee Green, um, and there's some debate over where that name came from. Some people think it's connected with the number of slaughterhouses that were once on the site. There was also a Birchley family who owned a lot of property in the area in the 15th and 16th centuries. So it's not entirely certain. I'm sorry if you are getting some background noise from me. Um, I am currently uh, contending with the demolition of Birchley Green, which I can't really control so um, please do bear with it. So going back to, to Birchley Green or Butchery Green is my favourite version of the name. It really came into, into being within Hartford in the 1600s uh, towards the end of Charles I's reign. Um, he owned all of that land and a lot of people who kept animals and had nowhere to keep them and graze them. So Hartford leased land from Charles I, which included the site of Birchley Green, as well as Hartham and the King's Meads, which is where that name also comes from. So let's just have a little look at the site we're, we're looking at. So this is a map from 1829, um, a plan of Hartford, and the area we're looking at is right in the middle. Um, you can see an unfamiliar named street, Back Street. Uh, this is Railway Street as we know it, uh, before the advent of the railway, which corresponds very nicely with Fourth Street. And Birchley Green is bordered on all sides, the river, as you can see here. Um, on the left, the red line, this is Green Street, which runs parallel with Bull Plain. And um, trying to put this into perspective, um, as people might recognise it, if you were stood on Railway Street looking towards WH Smith's, that would have been Green Street. Um, Birchley Green or Birchley Street is the other street which leads down to the bus station and car park. And the wiggly line you can see in the middle was City Street. Now the whole site um, in the 19th century was a labyrinth. It was full of yards um, and little courtyards and alleyways. And at its most populous, it was inhabited by 2,000 people, which is an awful lot of people to be in basically an acre of land. And it wasn't just residents, there were lots and lots of businesses going on within that site, slaughterhouses, beer houses, uh, maltings. It was an incredibly busy place. This map here, I was allowed to photograph Lord Salisbury from his archives at Hatfield House. Charles I passed on his lease, the lease between himself and the town of Hartford, to William the Earl of Salisbury, which is how subsequent Marquesses of Salisbury ended up owning large numbers of property within Birchley Green. And on this map, you can see all the properties in blue were those that were owned by Lord Salisbury and were visited by his rent collector. You probably noticed that there are lots of numbers on here um, that don't particularly correlate to streets. And at the time, um, in the 19th century, people didn't really tend to refer to the street within Birchley Green in which they lived. Um, they just referred to it as the green. And all of these houses are just numbered literally from one to whatever of the green. It's a slightly later map belonging to Lord Salisbury and you can see here they've not even bothered to write the names of the streets. On the left it says First Green, on the right for Birchley Street it says Third Green, City Street has become Middle Green. So we'll take a little look around and see what it might have been like. The photographs we have at the museum really date from around 1890 to the early 1930s. So there's a bit of a mixture between these, but it will give you an idea. Uh, this is Green Street and our vantage point here, if you imagine yourself standing in front of the old Waitrose entrance um, and looking towards Railway Street, this is the scene that you would have seen. And these are some more buildings in Green Street and to our eyes today I'm sure like me some of you are looking at these and thinking gosh they'd be worth a fortune today if they were still standing and had, had received some repairs but at the time um, they were not in a good state of repair. The landlords of these properties were not brilliant in terms of maintenance and upkeep. People uh, had no running water there were shared privies that were shared between multiple households and quite often situated next to shared water pumps. 
and in terms of removing waste products a lot of people wouldn't bother to trek downstairs to empty out a chamber pot so it was a pretty unpleasant place here are some houses in Birchley Street uh, which were demolished quite early on and again in Birchley Street. This picture I really enjoy, um, I think it gives you a really good idea of, of the sort of labyrinthine quality of, of Birchley Green. And some more yards and uh, courts. This building on the left of the photograph was actually the Butcher's Arms, which was situated in this court just off Birchley Street. This is Dye's dipping place, so if you imagine yourself on the riverbank looking towards the old barge, this was a place where people would come and collect water. You might want to queue up at the pump and exert yourself to collect drinking water, but if you're getting water just to do some washing, a lot of people would just pop down here to scoop some up. Children uh, swam from here very regularly. Um, sometimes there were incidents. Um, the water was not the beautiful clean river that we see today. It was full of refuse. There was a lot of problems with Birchley Green in terms of sanitation, which I've sort of briefly covered. And you've got this mixture of industry and residential waste being produced and nobody really taking responsibility for its removal. And Birchley Green became something of an embarrassment for the town to the point where really um, were toothless in convincing landlords to make any repairs. Nobody wanted to take responsibility. Nobody wanted to shell out money to improve the situation there. And so following the cholera ep epidemics in 1832 and then in 1848 um, it really came to a head. In 1851 about a third of Hartford's population lived in Birchley Green yet over half of the cholera deaths recorded in Hartford were from Birchley Green residents um, and as we all know today uh, the relationship between clean drinking water and cholera um, is very obvious. Um, and so people were incredibly embarrassed that within our beautiful town there was basically a giant cesspit with people living in horrific conditions. And so um, the ratepayers of Hartford, 10% of them actually wrote a petition to the General Board of Health asking for an inspection. And the General Board of Health came through and in July 1849, Superintendent Inspector William Ranger was sent to inspect the site. And this is what he had to say. Um, he found cesspools under human dwellings, effluvium so offensive parties could not occupy their lower rooms, dung heaps, pigsties, unpaved yards with foul water, fluid excrement soaking into outhouses, exposed privies, foul water and sewage flowing into cellars and into common uh, water supplies, um, heaps of dung and the accumulation of offal from slaughterhouses. So Superintendent Inspector Ranger was not impressed. And he made recommendations that the, the Hartford Council should set up a sanitary committee, but not everybody was um, keen on that idea, particularly the second Marquess of Salisbury, who owned so many of these properties. Um, so there were oppositions to it. But fortunately, in 1851, a new bill was passed to strengthen the 1848 Public Health Act. So this, this went to Parliament. But the second Marquess of Salisbury managed to have Hartford excluded from this bill. So everywhere else in the country, people had to make um, better provisions for tenants, but not Hartford. And uh, really not a great deal changed. And it got so bad that in 1885, there was a uh, publication produced called Hideous Hartford. Um, and in this publication, the third Marquess of Salisbury was uh, labelled an unscrupulous landlord of a foul labyrinth of pestilential filth, squalor and misery. This didn't do a great deal of harm to uh, his public image because the following year he, was, uh, he became Prime Minister and really nothing really changed in Birchley Green. Eventually Hartford built a new sewage plant which did make some uh, beneficial changes but uh, even by 1920 there was still no running water on Birchley Green and people were still sharing uh, communal toilets. So we've talked a little bit about the grim sanitation and the health consequences of that but I'd like to talk a little bit more about the people and the livelihoods going on on the site. This building is the Tallow House. You can see Folly Island on the other side of the river. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Tallow. Um, they are 
really uh, spectacularly smelly candles made from rendered animal fat and the production of tallow candles is really not pleasant for anybody in the vicinity so there'd be an awful lot of unpleasant smells coming from this site. It's a nice view of the river and it just gives us an idea of the industrial uh, scope um, of Birchley Green. These are all industrial buildings, grain houses, things like that. You can see the Folly Bridge there and this barge coming down the river. It's also a bit of an indicator of, of the cleanliness of the river. It doesn't look like something I'd want to go swimming in, but people did. There were also several maltings on Birchley Green. Barbers, McMullins, Youngs, um, a lot of these places had had malting kilns on the site and we're familiar now with the smells that come from McMullins when, when they're um, busy but um, this would have added to all of the overall aromas. I particularly love this picture which was very kindly loaned to us by one of our supporters. Um, it was taken in the 1940s. The tree, the large tree you can see on the left still stands today. It's the chestnut outside Lombard House, the Hartford Club, um, which still stands guarding the riverbank. And this malting um, was in what would have been Starbucks outside seating area um, on the riverfront. There were also a huge number of pub and beer houses in Birchley Green. On this map here, all the buildings in purple are pubs or beer houses that we know about. So even though people didn't have a great deal of money, they managed to squirrel some away for basically their only form of entertainment. And some of the oral histories that we hold here um, are from people who grew up on Birchley Green in the 1920s. And um, particularly for the young boys, one of the main sources of entertainment was to hang around on Railway Street um, on a Saturday and watch people fighting outside the pubs. So um, thankfully things have changed. And here's some images of some of those pubs. On the right hand side of your screen at the top, this is the Angel. Now the Angel backed, um, was on Railway Street with its back onto Birchley Green and it had lots of rooms and people rented them out and sometimes there were entertainments there. Um, below it is the Butcher's Arms that I mentioned earlier. In the centre is the Duncombe Arms. That's moved around the town a little bit. It started life in 4th Street in what is now uh, what became the Dimsdale Arms. And I think that's Il Vino now, the cafe there at the moment. Um, it then moved to Railway Street. And in the 60s, um, the building you can see here was demolished and it was just set further back from the pavement. Um, the sales particularly you can see on the left um, is for the leather bottle. Um, which was on Birchley Street and again Birchley Green was causing a bit of embarrassment for the town because of some of the antisocial behaviours associated with it. It wasn't somewhere that it was recommended for non-residents to venture. Um, another oral history we have um, is from a lady who, who her mother had tried to cut through there in a hurry and was met by her family doctor who berated her publicly for having gone onto the site. So um, as I say it was embarrassing were living in horrific conditions, there was antisocial behaviour and once the First World War had happened uh, people were very concerned about the idea of veterans coming back to live in these sort of conditions and there's this beautiful patronising uh, quote from the Hertfordshire record based on the fact that now that these men had served in the armed forces and been introduced to cleanliness it was going to be very difficult for them to go back to their old lifestyles and there was a lot of conversation about what was going to be the best way to house veterans and to improve the town. Um, not everybody was excited about that, change can be difficult um, so uh, there, there were some opposers to it but fortunately, the Ministry of Health were able to uh, loan the Hartford Corporation some money so that they could buy all of the properties on Birchley Green that they didn't already own. That meant that the Salisbury's were now no longer uh, landlords of the site and it gave the corporation the right to demolish all of it. Now, rather than build new houses for people there, the corporation felt that the town really needed town centre amenities. So that was, the, that was the plan. And so new housing estates were built at Horns Mill and Camps Hill for those returning veterans and for people who had, would be relocated from Birchley Green. But as I say, not everybody was pleased. Um, for people who'd grown up there amongst all the little courtyards and alleyways, it was home um, and it was what they were used to. And there were several news reports of people 
resisting relocation. Um, my particular one um, is of the elderly woman who sank into apathy and final insanity at being removed from uh, her, her courtyard. Well, the town corporation managed to get some more money from the Ministry of Health um, to improve uh, the town. And in 1935, they opened a brand new bus station um, public toilets and a car park and as you can see here it's a completely different site um, there's the folly on the other side of the of the river um, the bus station the bus waiting area facing it but a few of the buildings remained and on the right hand side of this picture behind the little bus you can see um, what was the ragged school and at this point it's now occupied by the Salvation Army the Ragged School was quite important to Birchley Green um, because for most of the children on the site, they weren't welcome in normal national schools. Some schools you still had to pay a penny to attend, but also because Birchley Green children often didn't have shoes. Um, many of them had lice and they weren't particularly fragrant. And the Ragged School was run by the Hartford Town Mission and uh, a chap called Hudson Dixon. And he and his wife were very, very busy in Birchley Green visiting people in trouble people they knew who were poorly seeing if they needed anything but the school made a huge difference they had about 200 children on the register at one point and some of those children went on to become teachers themselves at the school and it was really the only source of education for those Birchley Green children um, another building that survived um, the first the first refit of the site was this Maltings kiln on the corner of Birchley Street and Railway Street and this was owned by barbers and the museum car park. You can see in the bottom left of the screen um, the back wall of the museum. There we are. During the 40s, the museum owned allotments which were rented out to people. And by the time the bus station was built, that area was converted into a public car park for use by the town. But changes kept coming and in the 70s there were a lot more of them. Um, here you can see the construction of the flats and um, assisted living complex on Birchley Street. And in 1979 planning permission was passed for a new exciting shopping precinct for Hartford. This is the very high-tech model that was produced uh, to inform stakeholders of what they could expect. Work began very soon. Um, I get a bit misty-eyed looking at these photographs. Um, I'm sitting here watching, um, watching it being taken down. And here are the photographs of Birchley Green uh, actually being constructed. Um, I like this one of the Jolly Builders. Um, they've got some good uh, PPE going on there. And you can see this building being demolished and the folly on the other side of the river behind. And here is Waitrose. Um, it opened in 1981 and um, at the time people were incredibly impressed apparently according to the news reports um, by the range of extensive wines and exotic cheeses. So um, for the next nearly 40 years people in Hartford were able to enjoy those exotic cheeses. And here are some photographs from the first day of shopping in the store. Um, we also, as part of the new complex, had an exciting modern bus station and car park and a range of other shops. And it brought people into the town. Um, we hope it will again when, our new, when the new uh, complex is completed. Here are some people shopping in 1982. And not much changed until 2017. These photographs were um, taken on the 12th of September and the team at Waitrose very kindly let us loose in to record their last day. And as you can see, the shelves are emptying, um, but it was very kind of them to share the day with us and let us document it. Shortly after that, the rest of the shopping centre closed. And as you all know, um, it's been a bit up and down, waiting for the new development. But today, pretty much what the scene looks like and work is speeding ahead to our new site. So Birchley Green has been many things. It has been a uh, land owned by the King. It has been a slum. It has been a no-go area and it has been a wonderful shopping precinct. Um, and we hope it will be a wonderful shopping precinct in the not too distant future.
Now, if you've got any questions at all, please do email me. That's my email address. If you'd like to see more images of Hartford, you can go to our Museum Images website, which is hartfordmuseumimages.org. Um, if you've enjoyed this talk and you would like to help support the museum, please do go to our website. There's a support us page and on our homepage, there's a donate button. So please, please do use it. And if you have any more queries about Birchley Green, as I say, you can email me but we also have a wonderful book here um, called the city of butchery green which has far more detail in it than these whistle stop talks um, and another one a scrapbook of the public houses in butchery green so if you'd like either of those books again do email me and i can sort that out for you so i really really hope that you've enjoyed the talk um, they're whistle stops and i hope it lightens up your lunch hour and i'm really really looking forward to next week when i'll be delving into the world of hartford markets um, so there's a lot to, to cover in that topic and it's more exciting than it sounds. So I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you.